the next the next record is it's hard for me to choose, but it's possibly my favorite album by Lakeside, The Untouchables, or just called Untouchables. Had Raid, one of my favorite tracks. Um, Real Love, which we talked about, Turn the Music Up. Untouchables was pretty killer. I mean, did you feel pretty good about that one? Oh, yeah, because we was trying to figure out what we're going to be next. And we was, for some reason at that time, I was looking at a lot of old Cagney movies and stuff. And I was like, hey, man, what if we be G-Men, but we be the Groove Men, a play on G-Men? And we had the badges and the suits and the hats. And we actually, every concept, we fell into it. We became it. You know, when we was filming, we had the machine guns. and We was around shooting one another. I mean, you know, we was doing all that like kids, right? And I remember... We went downtown LA and found this this old building and put up all the stuff like made it look like a like a headquarters. And we all were standing there and I'm standing there with my gun and and I like the Sammy Davis look with the flat top hat and and the shoes with the white and black shoes and standing there holding your machine gun like I will hurt you. <laughs> you know, and it was just a play on words. G men was the police, but our G men was gonna be the groove man. But we still protected the funk. Yeah. That was always our concept to like protect the funk. Yeah, yeah. But Untouchables was a that was a good uh, record there. Yeah, it, that one actually also had Tinsel Town, which you mentioned, or Tinsel Theory. Tinsel Town Theory, yeah, yeah, yeah the Hollywood story. Um, Alibi and. Uh, Oh, Alibi. Now, you see the story with that. Ballads. <laughs> Hell, that's what I'm saying. People didn't really know us for our ballads, but Alibi, wow. I mean, people really related to that song, you know, what it meant. You needed Alibi because you'd have messed up. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, I've been there. <laughs> right. See, you've been there. You needed that Alibi. Yeah. And then Ray was just... Hey, a dance record coming, Raid to Floor. We, 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 and seeing what happened to on Raid at the beginning of Raid, we always did our own sound effects. So even like on Rough Riders, we had those little styrofoam cups and brr, 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 we was on the cups and ha, ah, you know, and like we had horses, but they're styrofoam cups and we were recording this bathroom at uh, Studio Masters. And Studio Masters, was a studio by what is his name remember the guy back in the day that used to was the only white guy that was playing black music and his and he was out of tennessee or something but his signal was stretched everywhere oh yeah and it was only late at night i i, I know i know who you're talking about but i can't think of it yeah well anyway his sons was the one that had studio masters in l.a on third and we recorded fantastic voice and all this stuff at studio masters and they had a great bathroom that uh, had its own natural echo so what happened we set up all the mics in the bathroom we put a chair not right on the door but just a little bit back from the door right and put telephone books a telephone uh, ashtrays anything that would make noise and then what happened, I beat on the door like I'm knocking on the door. And then I beat on the door again like I'm knocking on the door. Then I kicked the door. And when I kicked the door, you heard me kick the door. Then you heard the door hit the chairs and knock everything over. That's how we did the intro to Ray. Wow. <laughs> I got to listen to it again and think of that. <laughs> Real soon after this, after this video. Um, so that was uh, 83, and then 84, you guys came back with Outrageous. And to me, I, I sense that the sound was changing a little bit. You guys were bringing in a little more electronics, and I guess trying to keep a little more with mm -hmm. what was happening in the mid-80s. Um, well, we were trying how... it. We was, we was like, you know, we were kind of on the ropes about it. We was like, okay. We'll try it with one or two songs and see how it works, you know. And at that time, 
Dick had uh, a couple of writers that he wanted them to write a song, asked us if we would let some guys write a song. And so he had let us write all our albums up to then. So we said, okay, yeah, they can do, I think they did two songs or whatever. And, and they were kind of a little bit more electronic. And then uh, we put some electronics on Outrageous, you know, electronic toms and all that kind of stuff. And it was all right, but it didn't seem as strong as the other records that we did, you know? To me anyway, I love the album. We had some great songs on there, but that just seemed like I didn't want to be chasing what's going on around us. I just wanted to be, let's just keep on thinking about just write a good song and let the song take its course. But the record company was bugging us to use them. They were some new up and coming writers. And so we went on and let, let them write on them. That's how that album came about. You know, it's funny as you add what's sort of like a trendy sound at the time. And a lot of times in doing that, it ends up making that sound more dated later on. More later on, you're right. You know, you're right. You're right about that. That's and 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 that's it's so easy for that to happen. That's why you have to concentrate on the song because I think the good song can be in any era. Just concentrate on the song and it, it it'll do its own thing. You know, it'll fight your battle for you. And after that, when you guys um, took a while to come back in '87 with uh, Power. Um, yeah, because we was trying to decide, you know, our relationship was, was was basically coming to an end with Solar because uh, Dick was doing other things. And when it, 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 we didn't see the emphasis on the record company anymore. He was doing business deals on stuff that didn't have nothing to do with records. And long as he was really into the record company, the record company was booming. But then he started giving the reins over to his daughter and different people because he started doing other things. And it was never the same after that. And we felt it. And they wasn't hustling the records like they used to. The records weren't coming out quick enough. You know, they just, they something happened to the motor. And we just felt like, well, it may be time for us to, to leave. You guys even went with uh, without the illustrated cover on that one. Yeah, all because they were like, well, why don't you just try to just show you guys? I hated the whole concept, okay? Because <laughs> I like being this and being that and being this. So they wanted us to just be us. So we tried it. To me, it didn't work. The it, Well, we were already worked because... It was our vision. When the record stepped in, when the record company stepped in and tried to make us their vision, never worked. All I wanted them to do was be good at moving records. And we would do the rest. We would bring you the record, we'll bring you the concept. When we come with it, just run with it, move it. But once they started trying to get into the groups, and tell the groups, hey, we think you'd be better now to be this. Maybe people are tired of the illustrations and stuff. And that was becoming a time when you couldn't get no open up album cover anymore. Mm -hmm. That was at the time when albums was finna, it was so much changing in the industry where albums was going to turn into cassettes. CDs. Yeah. And CDs, that was right at the beginning of CDs. That, that that particular album was right in that cross where it was a lot going on with the manufacturing of how records was gonna come out. So, you know, it's weird and it affected how you had to look at records, you know? We couldn't look at the open up. We wanted to open up mm -hmm. album cover and power. We were actually gonna be some guys, you know, workers that was trying to bring power, you know what I'm saying? But that, that's why you see that grid in the back. It was right when computers was changing and you see the grid in the back and, you know, all of that stuff. But that one, I don't think uh, we had we had a couple of good songs on there, but that album really was at the end of the deal. 
yeah, the record had relationship bullseye and um, still feeling good was pretty funky. Yeah, bullseye was a good ballad. Um, but overall, that record was not only more electronic, but also I would say overall it was mellower than. Oh, it was a lot mellower because they felt like we was just too funky and funk was going to go out. So let's try something different. And that's when you let the record company get into your stuff too deep. They don't play nothing. They don't write nothing. They don't sing nothing. How deep can you get? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've heard that frustrating, sad story too many times. And to have lived it, I can only imagine how frustrating it is. Oh, it was frustrating, man, that be living it, knowing that y'all don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not what our fans want. But when you got to deal with a record company and they putting up the money for it and they're using their politics and people don't realize, man, there's a lot of politics behind the scene. You can't just be a happy go lucky artist. <laughs> you got to get into some other stuff and the psychology of it. And you just want to be an artist. Let me do my art and you put it out. Head games, politics. Oh. And especially when Drugs. Dick, Dick, all of that, especially when Dick got less and less and less. And then you might have the people that's running it. You know, they be into drugs or something. You really screwed now because they really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so we basically saw that and and just it was time for us to go. Well, so the last studio record was Party Patrol in 90. Um, and that had a new Jack Swing influence to it. Uh, yeah, part of the yeah. Time. We was able to go back to illustration where we was the party patrol. You know, we was uh, uh, the guys that made the party happen. And I had, I actually had fun making that album. But you could see our vibe in that record more so than the power. You could see Lakeside again. You could feel it in the songs again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, especially Party Patrol. That was a funky record there. We went back to the funk on them. Yeah. But with that, a little bit of New Jack flavor. Yeah. Yeah, because that was the time we was in. So we said, well, we don't want to be too resistant, but then we're not going to give in to just the whole Teddy Riley thing. Because that's when Teddy Riley was really emerging. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We didn't want to sound like Teddy Riley, but we liked a lot of the keyboard stuff that he was doing and a lot of the tones and stuff that he's doing. So we wanted to focus more on new tones opposed to being a new group and trying to chase that. So we just added, and that's what kind of made it sound like that because a lot of those tones was being used on records, especially the, a lot of the keyboard pads and stuff like that was being used on, on records at that time. Yeah. So, uh, Fred, tell us what happened after that. There were no more studio records. You guys kept touring. And I know in 97, you put out a live record. Kind of just sum up what happened after after that. Well, after that, you know, like I said, we just, like you said, we kept touring. And a couple other companies wanted us, but it just didn't feel right. And we were touring and it seemed like at that point now all you have is your fans. You don't have no record company that really care about you anymore. You got your fans. And then a record company came and said, well, man, we just want to do a live album. So we were really game for that because we had never done a live album. And so we did it in Atlanta. Uh, it must have been 10,000 people there. And it was the perfect situation to do a live album. I actually had fun doing that live album. And it, it, it just turned out nice and showing what what it was to be at a Lakeside concert. And so we sort of approached the album that way, that we was just going to have the best live album we can. We're going to load it up with all our hits and let people see what we're about because we had never done that before. And after the live album, uh, we was going to stay with Solo, but then Solo was ending. 
where the whole company was ending, where all the artists was going different places and stuff. And so our thing was, well, we're going to tour. We're going to stay touring. And right today, we're still touring because what we did, we just fell in love with our fans and stopped worrying about what's happening with the industry, what's happening with record companies. And then record companies started dying. And it just ended up being the internet. So now that's what it is right now. Uh, the internet companies are bigger than what the record companies were. So you really don't have no record companies other than two or three of them, the big ones, you know, Columbia or Sony, or, you know, that's about it. Yeah. So we just started touring and kept the band like we were, you know, where we just said, well, we're going to stay together no matter what happens and we're going to keep on touring. And that was the best thing we could have ever done because we're still touring right now. I mean, I'm out again next week. I, I, I enjoy what we did. We just start going out on the weekends, be at home through the week to deal with your families or whatever you got to do. And then, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is work time. And we was, hit the road. Was there any like ebbs and flows in those, say, 20 years that you've been doing the touring? Were there uh, long periods where you took off or was it pretty consistent? No, there was one period where we, we never stopped working. We always worked. But it was a period where LL Cool J wanted to wanted us to play for him. So we played with LL for maybe three or four months, did the Grammys and a whole lot of shows that he was about to do. He wanted a real band. That's when rappers was trying to have real bands. Well, we was one of the best bands out there and he wanted to do it and let people know it was Lakeside. So he always, kept us on the front burner in ter terms of advertising that, hey man, I got Lakeside with me, the baddest band in the land, and I'm doing dates with them. So we had some wonderful times with LL Cool J. Then they approached us about the movie Eddie, and they wanted us to do the title track for the movie Eddie because Coolio had redid Fantasy Voyage. And, and through that span of leaving Solar, all of those things started happening with the Coolio situation, with the LL Cool uh, situation. So what we did for the next two or three years, we was doing that. We did uh, the video for the movie, and we also did the title track for the movie. And then we started doing some things with Coolio. We did a lot of performances with Coolio. How, how shocked were you guys with what? coolio achieved with that track we weren't shocked at all because coolio came to us and he was like man you know i've been listening to this man forever and i love this record man and i want to redo the record and we was like cool man but you can't be cussing in the record you know because we never wrote no records where we was cussing you know we always felt that our parents and stuff would look it would look bad for us to be cussing in the record when you can sell a record without cussing you don't have to cuss to sell a record. We proved it. So that was one of our pet peeves. We said, hey, man, you can do the record. And we'd love for you to do the record. But the record has to still have its respect. And you can't be cussing all through the record. Mm -hmm. So Coolio was like, cool, man. And he sold the record to Platinum without cussing in it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then... They actually approached Coolio first and said, hey, man, we want you to do this movie, Eddie. And I think they asked him for the to do it with the group. I forgot their name. We will, we will rock you. Queen? Queen. They wanted Coolio and Queen to do it. And Queen was like, no, man, I want to do this with Lakeside. So I thought, you know, we would just play, you know, do the track and maybe do a little background and that was it for us, you know? And Coolio was like, no, man, I want y'all to do the video with me. Uh, we're going to record this in the studio together. I want y'all on the record. You know, I mean, he just wanted Lakeside's influence. So we went in and cut the record, uh, sung on the record. And then we went and did the video and 
he wanted us. I just thought, you know, he wanted us in the video with him. So we actually in the video just kicking it, you know, us and Coolio. Got my drums on the baseball, uh, basketball court. They built a big old basketball court for us full of people. And I'm playing the drums and some scenes. There's some scenes I'm up with Coolio and we sang in the record. I mean, he wanted us in this video. So it turned out really, really nice. And then LL, after that, LL wanted us. So we spent the next, man, at least the next four or five years just dealing with Coolio and LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. And then people start calling for Lakeside again, you know, and we say, well, hey, man, we got, you know, we got to go on and, and perform for our fans. You know, we got to hit, hit, hit these concerts again, you know. And Coolio hated to see us go, but we had to get back on it, you know. And and that's the longest that we had been off the road. Yeah, about three years, three or four years. And from that point on, we haven't been off the road since. <laughs> that's fantastic. I want to um, ask just a few more questions and let you go. Yeah. Really appreciate all the time, Fred. Um, I want to try to ask you a few that are just going to be real quick answers for you. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, one is, with all the touring that you did, uh, going back in the day, let's say um, late 70s into the 80s, who would you say was um, somebody that you uh, shared a stage with, you know, were on a bill with, that just really impressed you with their performance, their talent? Stevie Wonder. The biggest, Stevie Wonder was the biggest concert that, I've ever been on in my life at the Rose Bowl. We did the Rose Bowl with Stevie Wonder. And it was so funny because it was a lot of acts on that show. And one of the acts was trying to punk us. I'm not going to call no names. And Stevie Wonder was like, no, I'm not having it. Yo, Lakeside is going to be on this show and they're going on next. And he called it. And we went on right before Stevie Wonder. We was the actor on before Stevie. And, he, and when he came out, he's, uh, we're jamming Lakeside. And he was singing. I mean, he gave us so much respect. I will never forget that. And his birthday is only a couple of days. Uh, I think he's the 17th on the 19th of May. And he showed us so much respect for just being another band out there that does the same thing that he does. He didn't have not a hateful thing in his body. And I mean, it brought tears to my eyes for him to come out singing Lakeside. What, what year would you say that was? This was, God, when was that Rose Bowl day? I can't even remember. It was in the 90s when we did that show with, with, with Stephen Wynn, somewhere in the 90s. Okay. But man, uh, the Rose Bowl was packed, 60,000 people. It was unreal. That's the biggest show I've ever done. Wow. Yeah. Funk music, what makes it so special? What does it mean to you? And why do you think it just keeps living on like it like it is? Well, you know, I feel like funk music doesn't even get the respect it should. But the thing about funk music, you couldn't even have rap music without funk music. Because that's what they draw to to have that feeling. Funk music is a feeling. And when it gets in your system, you gotta have it. And that's what funk music is. It's a feeling. And right today, all the rappers use all the stuff we've ever done and they can't do it. They can't do it without. It. They haven't come up with no kind of new music to be able to do rap with. They gotta do rap with us. So. Funk music is something that I think will live forever because it's everything to be funky in a record. And if you're not funky in a record, you're not feeling it right. And it all starts with the drummer, right? It starts with the drums. You got to have a foundation. And I think, you know, just the different beats that we've come up with over the years is what made it like, you know, people still ask me, how do I play that thing at the beginning? It's all the way live. Well, that was just something I used to practice. You know, it wasn't no big deal to me. And then Steve said, man, we're going to put this at the top of uh, It's All The Way Live. 
And now when I do a show, people come to me, man, how do you do that? But I'm a right-handed drummer, but you play that beat at the beginning as a left-handed drummer. Yeah. <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> right. do, do you feel like Lakeside's gotten its just due, like Lakeside has the acclaim and the attention that it should in the history of funk and R&B and soul? I think so from the people, but not from the industry. I don't think we may never have our due from the industry. You know, for some reason, it, it may have a lot to do with where we came from or how much Solar did or didn't do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I feel like there were other acts that was always promoted much bigger than Lakeside. But I think what made us big was the people. I think we was just always the people's champion. I think that's why we are still alive today is because of our fans. Our fans have been bigger to us than the industry has. They have treated us better than the industry. I mean, like right today, uh, BET Awards don't call me and say, hey, Fred, we want you to come down to BET Awards. As far as they're concerned, we're dinosaurs, we're extinct. Yeah. We started with BET. You know what I'm saying? Not right. But that's not just right. the way of the world. And so long as we got our fans, I don't worry about the industry. What's your favorite Lakeside track? Wow. Say yes, and not because I wrote it, okay? But because of the story. I like that story. That if you could catch a woman that's got everything, money, fame, power, everything a woman wish she could have, and you be that guy that says the right thing that gets her. I love that story. Which song do you enjoy playing the most? Oh, I love playing Fantasy Voice the most. Oh, it's such a joy to play that song, man. And I mean, I've been playing this song my whole life, and I still have to play that song like I was 20 years old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's what the song requires. Yeah. Our show basically dictates what you got to be. And uh, maybe that's what's kept, kept us young, is our show. But I love playing that song the most because uh, all of the elements in it and the, the audience participation. And we got a lot of songs where we like to pull the audience on on stage with us and, and participate in the record, or giving in the love, uh, something about that woman. Uh, Fantastic Voice, Ray. I mean, all of these songs, we make them audience participation. So our audience loves singing these songs with us. We always give them a section, you know, especially like in uh, uh, when we're doing uh, something about that woman, it's a section for the women and it's a section for the men. And a lot of times the women just kill the men, okay? They just kill them, you know? You can take it, take it from me. It's oh, like it most you know, the women, the <laughs> women be giving into love, baby. I'm giving into you. And then the guys, you can take it, take it from me. Where well, the women just kill them, you mm -hmm. know, and the guys, then they get into it and they want to be strong and show them, you can take it. They get loud. So, you know, I love, we love stuff like that. I, I mean, People don't realize how much fun we have. It's not just going to do a performance. It's going to have some fun. So we, we have fun just performing. Who, who, speaking of fun, who's the biggest prankster or comedian in the group? Hmm, that's a good one. Maybe, I'm trying to think, who would be the one? Uh, Tommy. Thomas Tom Shelby, by doubt, no doubt, Tommy Shelby. You know, he just got a a charisma and vibe about himself. You know, very positive though. He's always positive, and you know, the 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 whole group is very spiritual. And I guess that's what's kept us doing the right thing, because there's a line we won't cross. We're never gonna make no records and cuss you out. 
we're never going to do that. And as old as we are, we're still ashamed for our mom to hear a, a record with cussing in. We just can't do it. We we real old school. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm glad that I'm in a spiritual group because we truly care about one another. I've spent most of my life with these guys. So each one of them is like my brother. I mean, this is the family that I spend the most time with. And I don't have a lot of outside friends because all my time is spent with them. I'm, I'm with them every week. We can't wait to see one another. And that's the kind of group you want to be in. So I couldn't have been blessed more than what God has blessed me. It could have been a lot worse, you know? <laughs> wow, I'd say so. So I appreciate you letting me in for uh, this time into a, a piece of that family. Um, and, uh, you know, all those great stories and sharing time with myself and the fans. Yeah, how can uh, everybody best keep up with Lakeside and make sure they don't miss a show and all that good stuff? Right, right. Oh, yeah, well, you know, uh, you can catch me on my Facebook, Fred Alexander. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, my phone number's there for the world to see. Uh, we also have an original Lakeside page. Uh, you can go and leave comments. You can catch me on Instagram. You know, we're trying to do all of the social network stuff. But yeah, we do have a page you can go in. And then we also have a, uh, our Lakeside website. We just got a new one. Uh, what is it? I think it's www.lakesidemusic.com. I think that's it. And so you can just about catch us anywhere. But as we update, I'm gonna make sure I keep your numbers and stuff. And as we update things, I'll definitely let you know so you can let our fans know, you know, cause you, it's good to have people like you that have a connection that want to do this. I mean, it's an art form and what you're doing right now and informing people, you know, what's going on. Cause I realize a lot of times people want to know what's really going on behind the scenes. How do we stay up for this? How do we do this? Uh, the exercise that you got to do and stay in shape. I mean, most of the stuff I do is a little weight. I do a lot of sit-ups and a lot of push-ups. You know, and that that keeps me pretty much together. But I'll keep you updated on the schedule. As I, as I mentioned, we just like getting people off. I like messing with people. I like uh, making them happy. I remember a lady brought her husband to one of our shows and her, his brother had died. And he was all sad and stuff. And she was like, well, honey, I'm going to surprise you and, and give you a pickup, you know, after the funeral. And this was the same day of the funeral. So wow. after the funeral, she brought him to our concert and brought him backstage for me to meet him and everything. He was like, man, I was I was so sad when I came in. And he said, now, this was just what I needed, man. I feel great just because of you guys. Well, that really touched me that I made him feel better after going to a funeral. I mean, that gave me the eebie-jeebies just to make, you know, I was tingling all over just to hear how affected he was from our show. Stuff like that is what gets me about being in this business. Power you know? music, yep. Yeah, that's the stuff that gets me. The little things like that is what turned me on. So I want to tell my fans, keep on doing it. Keep on loving us. Keep on being behind us. And we're going to keep on doing the funk as long as we can. That's what we love to hear. <laughs> Hey, we're going to be there, like I said, till the end, baby. Original Lakeside for life. <laughs> well, thank you and so Scott, much. I, I, I just want to thank you too, Scott. You know, uh, uh, I never knew anything about this show. And when you called me, uh, it was nice that you was really serious. Like, man, I want to interview you and da da da, da. And, you know, it, it, it's a blessing because it, it could be people that don't want to interview so I just want to thank you for wanting to give people knowledge about Lakeside. And thank you for having this show. I think what you're doing is a wonderful thing. It's almost unfortunate, but had to end the interview at some point. He had so many great music insights and memories to share. And even after we finished taping, he was kicking himself for forgetting to tell me about almost getting killed during a visit to Africa. Wow. Sounds like 
the fantastic voyage may have encountered some Somali pirates. <laughs> well, more stories perhaps for another day. You know, I have been wanting to have Lakeside on the show for a year or more to hear that fantastic story and bring it to the Truth and Rhythm audience. I'm so glad that we're finally able to do that and deal with such style. I mean, Fred's colorful tales really brought it to life. And for me, I'll tell you, Lakeside had lots of great songs, but in particular, I could listen to a loop of Pull My Strings, Raid, It's All The Way Live, and Fantastic Voyage Forever. Special thanks once again goes out to the Rhythm G-Man protector of the almighty groove, Mr. Fred Alexander Jr. Also, as always, a big thank you out to you, the viewers and listeners, for that support and interest. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous installments at FunkyStuff.net, on YouTube, and through iTunes and other leading podcast providers. Subscribe to Truth and Rhythm. Subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. We need that support. Show the world that you uh, haven't forgotten about the funk, that you support the musicians, the artists that do the great funk, jazz, and R&B music. Bring power to it. Power to the funk people. Uh, if you've already subscribed, get friends and family to do so. Much appreciated. Also want to hear from you. Email me at scottg at funkinsift.net. Let me know who else you want to see on the show, what you like, maybe what you'd like to see done differently, anything. It's a two-way dialogue. This is your show, so help uh, create it. I will let you know, though, that um, if there's someone on your mind, it's probably also popped into my head. I've probably been working on it. But still, you know, if you drop me a line and I see that, I'll focus even harder on those folks. Some people are a little intimidated by the video format or have other things going on. Um, so, you know, definitely challenges out there. But at any given time, I probably have about three dozen balls in the air for this show. So that's a little behind the scenes uh, info for you. And so with that, going to bring it home. As always, saying this is Scott Dr. Jake Skullfine. And keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one. One, one, one.